The ground is too hard, you may say. Patrick, you don't understand. I've dealt with this issue a long, long time. I've asked God, sought him. It's too hard. I can't do it. Dig what you can. Get some help. Come here to the church. Ask someone to pray with you. Ask someone to help you shoulder that shovel and to dig with you. You're not meant to do this alone, friends. I get excited when I see people come to the house of God to fellowship with like-minded saints. What that says is I know I can't do life without the brothers and sisters of Christ. I can't do life without Jesus. Dig what you can. Get some help. Amen. Good morning. morning. Great to see you all in the house of the Lord. Glad you're here. I want to pray again before we dive in, before we read God's word. Lord, I thank you so much for allowing us the honor and the privilege to worship you. You are good. You're right. You're here with us today. Open up ears. Open up hearts. Be glorified through the reading of your word and through the message today. In Jesus' name, amen. So have any of you ever had the opportunity to be intentional in life about anything? Just think about that for a minute. You all got here somehow. Most of you were wearing pants. It's a start. Sometimes we've got to be intentional about things. I've flown to, to India on a number of occasions. <clears throat> Never once did I go to the airport with no bags or no plane reservation. Because I wouldn't go anywhere. I made sure before I went to the airport, I had tickets, had my bags, and then I had a ride on the other side when I finally landed in India, because I didn't know how to get around India. I also packed some Imodium, Tums, (laughs) things like that, things that people said that I should definitely take. Our God is an intentional God. He created the universe ex nihilo out of nothing. He created with intention. Genesis talks about how God created everything and then he declared it is very good. When he created us, he knew us before we were knit together in the womb. He knew us in the secret place, knew our names before we were ever brought into the world. He tells Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1.5, I knew you in the womb and I called you, I consecrated you to be a prophet to the nations. And in Jeremiah 29.11, he says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. God is very intentional in how he's created this universe, how he's created us. So consequently, he's asking us to be intentional as well. Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica these words. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit, which is to hinder the work of the Holy Spirit within you. Basically telling, Holy Spirit, you go hang out there right now, because I'm doing this myself. Do not despise prophecies, the proclamation of the Word of God. Test all things, hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Friends, is it possible for us to abstain from every form of evil if we're not intentional? Am I able to pray without ceasing if I'm not intentional about it? Am I able to rejoice always if I'm not intentional? When that guy cuts me off on the highway, am I going to be able to rejoice? I like to think so, but I dare say my bride and my two babies would say otherwise. I don't always rejoice. Our God is intentional and calls us to be intentional. So I want to talk to you today about intentional faith. You had to have intention 
to come here this morning. There had to be a plan in place. He had to know where the pants were, how to turn the ignition in the car, how to get here. There was some intentionality behind this morning. God wants us to live our life in intentionality. We can allow life to just happen, sure. Take us wherever it takes us. God's calling us to something different. Intentional faith requires three different things. The first, it begins with preparation. I want to talk about this passage in the book of 2 Kings in the third chapter. Powerful passage. I love it. It speaks to what preparation looks like. In the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Jehoram, the son of Ahab, if you remember Ahab, he was married to that peach of a woman by the name of Jezebel. They were a sweet, sweet couple. <laughs> Adorable. <clears throat> he became king over Israel and Samaria, and he reigned 12 years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, though not like his father and mother, for he put away the pillar of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he clung to the sin of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He did not depart from it. So not a very pleasant fellow. Now Mesha, the king of Moab, was a sheep breeder, and he had to deliver to the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. But when Ahab died, the king of Moab was like, ha, I'm not serving you anymore, chump daddy. I am not afraid of you. So Joram marched out of Samaria at that time and mustered all of Israel. He went and sent word to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to fight against Moab? And he said, I will go. I am as you are. My people is your people. My horses is your horses. And then he said, by which way shall we march? Jehoram answered, by the way of the wilderness of Edom. So they also picked up the king of Eden, Edom to go and fight against the king of Moab. So the king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom, and they went and made a circuitous march of seven days. There was no water for the army or for the animals that followed them. Then the king of Israel said, Alas, the Lord has called these three kings to give them into the hand of Moab. Now, I want you to hear this, friends. Does this sound a little bit familiar? The nation of Israel, when they were freed from Egypt captivity, slavery, they get out into the wilderness and they start telling Moses, we were better off in Egypt, man. At least they had a Baskin Robbins. We had all that we needed in Egypt. Now we're out here and there's nothing. It's desert. It's miserable. Ain't no Chick-fil-A. Dave's Hot Chicken. Have any of you ever been to Dave's Hot Chicken? Oh, you need to go and change your life. Dave's Hot Chicken. So the godless man was the one who was expressing fear. We're going to die out here. And then Jehoshaphat, the man of God, said, Is there no prophet of the Lord here through whom we may inquire of the Lord? So the man of God does not succumb to fear at this point. He instead says, Where is God here? Is there a man of God that we might connect with and figure out what God's doing? See the difference in response. Then one of king of Israel's servants answered, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. How would you like to be known for pouring the water on the hands of someone else? That is some serious street cred. When I walk down the street, I want someone to say of me, he poured that water on the hands of this other guy. He should be respected and revered. And Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel... And Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. Now, Elisha, man of God, not intimidated by this earthly king, he says, what have I to do with you? Go back to the prophets of your father and mother. Notice the man of God doesn't fear this earthly king. Back then, you wouldn't talk to a king that way. They'd lop off your head. You'd be walking around just a stump with legs, no head. Some days I felt that way. But the king of Israel said to him, No, it is the Lord who has called these three kings to give them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, were it not that I have regard for Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would neither look at you nor see you. Can you imagine having the courage to say that to a king? 
who could take your head clean off? I hope that I have that kind of courage and boldness. And then Elisha says, bring me a musician. What else would you say in that moment? You get done chewing out an earthly king, now go ahead and bring me a musician. Have any of you ever listened or watched those Rocky movies years ago? You know that Rocky music would come on. I'd get up out of my chair, go run around the yard for a few minutes, think I was going to run 10, 12 miles and made it about 100 feet, went back inside to finish the movie. There's something about music that changes our heart. Maybe softens it, maybe enlivens it, quickens it. There's something about when I get behind that, that drum kit and start to play, something changes within me. I can't explain it. I, I tell people all the time, I really don't know how to play drums. People have asked me for lessons for over the years. I really don't know what I'm doing back there. I just listen to music and I worship God. That's it. I really don't know what I'm doing. But there's something about music that draws me in to the throne room. Back in the Old Testament time, they would send the, the worshipers, some of the singers in the front of the battle party when they went into battle. They knew how important it was to worship the king who would give them victory and protection. He said, thus says the Lord, I will make this dry stream bed full of pools. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind or rain, but the stream bed shall be filled with water, and you shall drink, you, your livestock, and your animals. This is just a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He's also going to give the Moabites into your hand. So not only am I going to fill this desert full of water, but I'm also going to defeat your enemies. No problem. I got you. So they go to Elisha, thirsty dehydrated. He tells him, go back out in the desert and dig some holes. I think I might have something to say about that. Are you insane? You want me to dig ditches? I'm already dying of thirst. How would you respond in that situation? I need to stop over at Sonic first and get me a big gulp or Route 44 drink before I start digging a ditch in the desert. When we pray, we read the word of God. We seek God's face we're, in essence, my friends, putting a shovel in the ground. We're asking God, send the rain. Every time we pray, every time we read the word, every time we come to church, God, I'm asking for something that I don't have in and of myself. Would you send the blessing? Revelation 3.20, Jesus says that he stands at the door and knocks. If anyone opens the door and lets him in, he will dine with them. There's an old painting from years and years and years ago. I want to say the Renaissance area. I'm not sure. There's this painting of a door covered with vines and thistles. It's overgrown. Jesus stands there knocking. There's no doorknob on Jesus' side. The doorknob's on the inside, the inside of our heart. Jesus is saying, all you need to do is turn that knob a little bit. I don't need much room. Just crack the door. He's not going to barge in. He's a gentleman. He's not going to force himself on you. He stands at the door and knocks. The ground is too hard, you may say. Patrick, you don't understand. I've dealt with this issue a long, long time. I've asked God, sought him. It's too hard. I can't do it. Dig what you can. Get some help. Come here to the church. Ask someone to pray with you. Ask someone to help you shoulder that shovel and to dig with you. You're not meant to do this alone, friends. I get excited when I see people come to the house of God to fellowship with like-minded saints. What that says is, I know I can't do life without the brothers and sisters of Christ. I can't do life without Jesus. Dig what you can. Get some help. I'm going to be mocked at, laughed at. I can't take my Bible to school. I can't pray before I eat, especially at school. The kids will see me and they'll poke fun at me. If I don't go along with the crowd, I'm going to be a nerd, a square. What do the kids say today? What do you, punk? I'll be a punk. Words haven't changed much over the years. Yeah. 
The world tells us, why depend on God? Why depend on some benevolent grandfather in the sky that we can't see? Do it yourself. You've got the wherewithal. You've got the smarts. You've got Google. Do it yourself. I poured a concrete slab in my backyard not too long ago. I didn't, I've never poured concrete before in my life. So immediately I went to Google how to pour a concrete slab. Found some YouTube videos. Figured out kind of how to do it-ish. It looks sort of okay-ish. It's got a bunch of grills on it, so you can't really see it. But the world would tell us, you don't need God. You don't need this space. Just go ahead and sleep in. There's a game on. I'm sure there's some kind of game on. God is calling us to be faithful, to live and surrender, to allow him to do the heavy lifting. Pastor Kyle, for the last couple weeks, has been talking about rest, allowing Jesus to carry our burden. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, you know this verse already. We've heard it for the last couple weeks. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Intentional faith, friends, begins with preparation. If I'm going to go fly somewhere, I've got to make sure I'm preparing the way for that to happen. I can't just show up at the airport. Here I am. Take me wherever. Intentional faith also will lead us to a point of decision. I'm either going to be obedient, whether blessing or pain. I've made the decision. Dug the ditch. God's telling me where to go from here. I remember when Jennifer and I, we moved out to Colorado from upstate New York years and years ago. I got saved around 93, about six months into our marriage. Jennifer thought I'd lost my mind, gone crazy. And then a few years after that, God called me to preach I talked to my pastor at the time, and he went out to Colorado to go to Bible college years and years before that. So we thought, okay, seems like God is calling us to leave family, friends, houses, jobs, everything. To go halfway across the country to a place we did not know, didn't know anybody, didn't have jobs, but felt like God was saying, yes. So we did it. Scary. I remember also back in 2013, Jennifer and I, we'd already had Haley for a couple years. We got her when she was three years of age. So we thought, we want another kiddo. We got this sweet little girl in our house. Her name was Gabby. We met her. She was a premature baby. She was addicted to meth. And she was in really bad shape. We brought her into our home. Jennifer took such good care of that sweet little girl. Haley was a great sister to her. Within three months' time, the, the social worker said, there's a family out east that wants this girl. So they came out one Monday. By the end of that week, Gabby was gone. We thought we were going to be able to adopt her. It just ripped the heart out of my chest. I called the foster care adoption agency, and I said, we're done. Just rip up our license. I'm not doing this again. After a night of agonizing, praying, crying, I could hear from God, you're not done. So I called the social worker back up, left another voicemail. She must have thought I was nuts. And I said, okay, we're still in this. We'll keep the license in place. January of that following year, this all happened around October, we got a call from the, from the caseworker and said, there's a, there's a boy here who needs a family. Almost 12 weeks premature, two and a half pounds in the NICU, wires all sticking out of him. He was so tiny. He's going to require oxygen. We don't know how long he'll be in the NICU. We're just, yeah, of course. We already had sweet little Gabby a few months before who was on oxygen. We kind of knew what we were doing. It was terrifying at the time. Now I felt like I could just take a premium and just 
you know, just whatever, just have a great time, take them out for a hot dog, you know, that kind of thing. So we were ready. We were ready to go. You see my little boy around here, right, Noah? He's a rootin' tootin' little dude, 10 years of old, man in training, loves God. He and his sister both love Jesus. We've come through some hard circumstances, but God is faithful. God knew what he was doing. Intentional faith leads us to a point of decision. Jesus experienced what we would call the dark night of the soul when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was to be scourged, beaten, thrown up on the cross. I don't know that he was afraid of that, but what human wouldn't be afraid of that? I would be. But his pain, his sorrow was coming from the fact that he was going to be separated from his heavenly father. He'd never experienced that before. Matthew 26. Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. In that, my friends, I hear, I'm afraid, I can't bear this. Are you sure? I trust you. I will obey. Many of you ever been there? Jesus knew he was going to be separated from his father, and he couldn't bear it. But he had made the decision already. He had done the work of preparation, knowing what God wanted him to do. So there was no question what decision he was going to make. Was fear present? I believe so. Do you think Jesus was afraid? Well, he experienced everything we did, and yet without sin. So yeah, I think he was afraid. Nelson Mandela says this, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. Winston Churchill is often quoted as saying, fear is a reaction, courage is a decision. My friends, just to be alive today, courage is necessary. The kiddos down front here, they're still going to school. You've got to have courage to go to school. My daughter tells me that every day she's offered something from some student. It takes courage to live today, particularly if you're a believer. Kind of easy to be afraid all the time. I don't have to think about being afraid before I get up here this morning. I'm afraid. Before I sit back in those drums, I'm afraid. Every time somebody asks me to speak, do this, do that, my first answer always before I open my mouth is no, because I'm afraid. It's way easier to not do that thing. But God's called me to something different. So I'm going to show courage and step forward anyway, even though I'm afraid. I've been up all night, gut just spinning, thinking about this, all this anxiousness. So after this, I'm just going to pass out for sure. Maybe after you get a bucket of chicken. Let's see. <laughs> Courage is telling the enemy of your soul, you have taken enough ground. Courage is saying, I am not satisfied with the way things are going right now. I am done. You're not going to take another inch, devil. You've taken enough of my life, enough of my heart. I'm done with this addiction. I'm done with these words that spew out of my mouth. I'm done treating my family the way that I've been treating them. I'm choosing a different way. You're finished running my life. That's courage. Fear just allows us to join the group, do what everybody else is doing. Everybody else is doing it. I don't want to stand out. I don't want to be called a punk or a chump or a doofus, whatever. There's a book written years ago called Jesus Freaks. It was written by the, the group DC Talk. Some of you may know that group from a while back. 
along with a partnership from a ministry called the Voice of the Martyrs. The Voice, Voice of the Martyrs is a ministry that tracks Christians all around the globe who are being persecuted because of their faith. One of the stories here captivated my heart, primarily because I have a 16-year-old girl and a 10-year-old son. The communist soldiers had discovered their illegal Bible study. As the pastor was reading from the Bible, men with guns suddenly broke into the home, terrorizing the believers who had gathered there to worship. The communists shouted insults and threatened to kill the Christians. The leading officer pointed his gun at the pastor's head. Hand me your Bible, he demanded. Reluctantly, the pastor handed over his Bible, his prized possession. With a sneer on his face, the guard threw the word of God on the floor at his feet. He glared at the small congregation. We will let you go, he growled, but first you must spit on this book of lies. Anyone who refuses will be shot. The believers had no choice but to obey the officer's order. A soldier pointed his gun at one of the men. You first. The man slowly got up and knelt down by the Bible. Reluctantly, he spit on it, praying, Father, forgive me. He stood up and walked out the door. I think back on this moment here, and in judgment, I think, what is up with that guy? What a coward. But then I think, wait a minute, I've got a daughter, a son, a bride. I've got a family that God has put me in charge of. Would I have responded in the same way? Or would I have stood up for my faith? I'd like to think I would have stood up. I don't know. Okay, you, the soldier said, nudging a woman forward in tears. She could barely do what the soldier demanded. She spit only a little, but it was enough. She, too, was allowed to leave. Quietly, a 16-year-old girl came forward. Overcome with love for her Lord, she knelt down and picked up the Bible. She wiped off the spit with her dress. What have they done to your word? Please forgive them, she prayed. The soldier put the pistol to her head and pulled the trigger. The decision that young lady made was made well before that day in that house church. She had done the work of preparation. She had allowed God to fill every void, every vacant space in her heart and life with his presence. She had made the decision, God, no matter what, I'm sticking with you. <clears throat> Intentional faith begins with preparation. Intentional faith leads us to a point of decision. And finally, intentional faith beckons us to step forward. In the book of Joshua, in the third chapter, this is the point in the nation of Israel's history when they're finally going to be allowed to cross over into the promised land. They were allowed years before, but they were disobedient. So they'd kind of been just hanging out in the wilderness for 40 years, just chilling, wearing the same clothes for 40 years. They didn't rot out or anything. I do that today. Jennifer gets on me a little bit, but, you know, they're comfortable. Why wash them? So the Lord, he tells Joshua, here's what's going to happen. You're going to call the, the Levitical priests who are going to carry the Ark of the Covenant. You're going to tell them they are going to lead the way across the Jordan River. At that time, the Jordan River was at flood stage. It was like a white water rapid kind of thing. The current was strong. To step into that would be craziness because it, it'd sweep you away. You could die. God said to Joshua, you tell the Levitical priests they are to carry the Ark of the Covenant, which, in fact, if you messed up the way you carried the Ark of the Covenant, you'd just get struck dead. This is why I can never be God. I'd be smoting people left and right. Cut me off, smote. Didn't give me onions on my burger, smote. Everybody's getting smoted in my kingdom. This is why I can't have a kingdom, my friends. So the Levitical priests are told, you're going to cross over first, and then the nation of Israel will follow you. Here's the catch. You have to step your foot into the water. Once that happens, once that foot goes in, that's when I'm going to stop up the water, and it'll stand upstream in a heap. 
and you'll cross on dry ground. Can you imagine those first two priests leading the procession? Do you think priests back then had sick day? I got a tummy ache. I can't come in today. Do you think they were scared? I would have been terrified. Once their feet went into the water, God would stop it up and they could cross on dry ground. It required a step forward. The work of preparation was done. They trusted that God is going to reveal to them the land of promise. They had made a decision long ago. We're not going to bend again. We're going to trust you, God. Now it was time to step forward, to step forward with courage. There's a sweet poem, treatise, commitment, whatever you would like to call it, that was written years ago. It was credited to a Rwandan man back in around the 80s who was forced by his tribe to renounce Christ or die. Just like the little girl in the story I read earlier, he had made the decision long ago. He had done the work of preparation. He had made the decision, I'm not turning away from my God. No way, no how. So he made the decision. The next day he was shot. In his room, they found this, this treatise, this commitment that he drafted, that he wrote from his heart. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. And my future is secure. I am finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, chintzy giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I now live by presence, lean by faith, love by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by power. My pace is set, my gait is fast, my goal is heaven. My road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions few. My guide reliable, my mission clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go until I come, until he comes, give until I drop, Preach until all know and work until he comes. And when he has come for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My colors will be clear. Friends, the decision is made after we have done the work of preparation. We've sought God and allowed him to fill every empty space in our hearts and in our being, every void, every dry spot. We've allowed him to send the rain. We make the decision, I am going to follow you no matter what. I'm going to trust you. And then we step forward. What place are you at today, my friends? Are you digging? Do you need to go to Lowe's after this message? Get your shovel? Have you picked up the shovel in a while? Spent time in the Word of God? Maybe just getting on your knees and talking to him, crying out to him, asking him, send the rain. Father, thank you so much for the truth of the word of God. Thank you for how you allow us to come close to you, how you have purpose and meaning for our lives. Help us to find what that is, God. Through digging ditches, doing the work of seeking you, asking you to fill our hearts through making the decision to trust you no matter what. And then help us to step forward whatever space you'd have us to go. We love you. We commit our hearts and our lives to you in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.
I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve, sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment and let us know and, and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.